Coming to DARPA is like grabbing the nose cone of a rocket and holding on for dear life. DARPA's a place where if you don't invent the internet, you only get a B. A DARPA program manager quite literally invents tomorrow. Coming to work every day and being humbled by that. DARPA is not one person or one place. It's a collection of people that are excited about moving technology forward. For more than 60 years, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, has held to a singular and enduring mission to make pivotal investments in breakthrough technologies for national security. Working with innovators inside and outside of government, DARPA has repeatedly delivered on that mission, transforming revolutionary concepts and even seeming impossibilities into practical capabilities. Welcome to Voices from DARPA, a window onto DARPA's programs, partners, and performers. My name is Stacey Wersba, and I'll be your DARPA host today. Today, we're speaking with Dr. Joanna Arthur, who joined DARPA in August 2022 as a program manager, or PM, in the Biological Technologies Office. Her research interests include operational neuroscience, human performance optimization, and predictive analytics, leveraging advances in cognitive and behavioral science. We asked Dr. Arthur to provide her perspective as a new program manager, what sparked her interest in the field of neuroscience, and what she hopes to accomplish in her limited tenure. Here's Dr. Arthur. My background is really in human machine interfaces, looking at brain computer interfaces in the past for like imagery analysis. And here, I really want to get into that space again in human systems integration, really not only understanding human machine interaction, but understanding human to human interaction, how we can sort of um, model that and build that into human to machine interaction as well. Looking at predictive models of people's psychological states, cognitive load states, information processing, things like that. I was one of the few people in college that actually knew what I wanted to major in. So I knew right off the bat I wanted to, you know, be a psychologist. I just wasn't sure about the specialization. So I had some great mentors growing up in high school that were psychologists. I could see myself as being a psychologist. So when I got to undergrad and I took this one class, I want to say it was junior year, that blew my mind. It was called biological psychology. And so it was more the, you know, the biological basis of the brain instead of dealing with neurodegenerative disorders and trying to counsel people, it's more like, okay, what was the basis of those disorders? And that's when I knew this is it, <laughs> neuroscience. I think I applied to like 13 grad schools and I ended up choosing GW because, uh, you know, I'm a city girl. <laughs> so from Brooklyn, I was like, okay, DC, close enough. I went straight from college to grad school. I didn't take a break. I started in Dr. John Philbeck's lab, Brain and Navigation. And spent about almost five years looking at something called path integration. So basically, if I took away your vision, we're able to remarkably, we can see a target, like maybe up to like five meters away, close your eyes and walk pretty darn close to that target. And so I did that, trying to understand sort of neural correlates of path integration and angular path integration in normal and clinical populations. After that, I again, did not take a break. I went straight to postdoc. I did my postdoc at Johns Hopkins University of Medicine. As you can see here, it's this kind of linear progression, typically with, you know, grad school and in science, it's like a highly structured environment where you kind of have this pseudo certainty. You do A and you got to do B and you got to do C, this like linear academic lineage. And so I did this postdoc looking at path integration, but in a different patient population. So at GW, I was looking at people who had medial temporal lobectomy, so a small part of the MTL resected and how that impacted the behavior. And decided to look at path integration in people who had vestibular deficiency. So I worked in the otolaryngology clinic at JHU. And then that's when I had that light bulb moment. Okay, <laughs> I'm kind of tired of working in this little esoteric area, and I kind of want to do something broader, bigger impact. And at that time, I was part of the JHU Postdoc Association. So you had people come in, like consulting companies trying to recruit students. And that's what kind of opened my world to these sort of non traditional paths. So back then, it's like, you know, you're expected to go into academe. So I felt like a rebel, like I was going to go some, do something different. And I stumbled across something called NGA. And this is not National Gallery of Art. It was NGA, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. I had no idea. I had no background in photogrammetry or geospatial. But I said, oh, you know, this kind of seems like I, I do spatial navigation. This kind of seems like spatial navigation. And applied and I got accepted right off the bat. <laughs> and what was cool is that I got to directly apply my neuroscience background, but it was on a larger scale, right? So I was doing small scale navigation. You know, you're talking about NGA who's dealing with <laughs> large scale navigation and satellites, right? And so the cool thing is that the first thing I worked on was a DARPA program. So it was a DARPA program called Neurotechnology for Intelligence Analysts. It started out in 2005. 
and they were looking at trying to build this fast image triage system. So our analysts, they exploit imagery, right, <laughs> that comes out of the satellite. And so how can we use neuroscience findings to kind of increase the exploitation of imagery? The vision for DARPA's Neurotechnology for Intelligence Analysts, or NIA, program, which launched in 2005 and ended in 2013, was to revolutionize how analysts handled intelligence imagery, increasing throughput of imagery to an analyst and overall accuracy of assessments. The program sought to identify robust brain signals that could be recorded in an operational environment and processed in real time. The program aimed to apply these triage methods to static, broad area, and video imagery, with the hope of enabling analysts to train more effectively and process imagery with greater speed and precision. So NIA was predicated on two major findings in neuroscience. One was called RSVP, so Rapid Serial Visual Presentation. So if I chip up these images and show it to you really quickly, our analysts actually can visualize things of analytic significance at really quick speeds. Like I'm talking about like less than 250 milliseconds. So that was exciting finding. <laughs> and the second major finding, so when you do see something of significance, it's really quick and you have a neural signature called the P300. So based on those two findings, that's where NIA was born out of. And so I came in as what's called a T&E lead, test and evaluation. So taking the technology that was developed by the DARPA and applying it to actual real Im classified imagery <laughs> and seeing if it works in the real world on real world mission. And so what I did for about five years is we had a, what's called a GEAT, a Geospatial Intelligence Advanced Test Bed, going out and setting up these standalone systems. So taking the technology that DARPA developed, bring it in-house in our footprint, recruiting analysts to come and sit in these trials. <laughs> and still set up the databases, manage the team, and run these trials to see if they actually work. Innovators often refer to the gap between federally funded research and new commercialized technologies as the valley of death, where new technologies go to die. While DARPA makes every attempt to bridge this gap, some new technologies are not picked up by the services or commercial partners for a variety of reasons. Again, transitioning here to DARPA is that I've seen that other side where people build neurotechnology and these new tools and brain computer interfaces, but we usually don't see a good transition, right? So NEO was a good news story for DARPA in that it was the ICs, intelligence community, first operational test of bringing EEG and eye trackers into a SCIF, into a classified area and testing it out. That was a big win. While NEO didn't officially transition, it did afford us researchers within NGA an opportunity to understand a lot of the like social and cultural context around our imagery analysis. So when you're dropping a piece of technology, you're not just dropping it into the silo. There's a huge social and cultural understanding the technology and the tools and the tradecraft that people bring to imagery analysis. So it allowed us to look at that from end to end and led to a lot of other lines of investigations. There's also a lot of lessons learned in terms of trying to do test and evaluation with our actual analysts in an operational environment. Typically, we're bringing them out, we're disrupting their workflow, bringing them into a lab, bringing them into an academic setting. With NIA, we are actually able to do it within our operational footprint. So, really push the science there as well in terms of human subjects testing. We asked Dr. Arthur to tell us what brought her to DARPA. I kind of always knew <laughs> that I wanted to be here. So, I worked my way up from being the teeny lead, eventually to being the deputy program manager. And I think I knew then back in 2010, 2012, that I was like, oh, this seems like a cool job. Eventually on my career trajectory, I want to do it. So as you move up into the government, you do end up tending to go into more managerial role, moving on that ladder, career ladder of being a manager. And I was moving away from the science. And it was great to be well-rounded, to understand things like budget and managing resources and people. But I came to DARPA specifically just to get back to the science, get back to my roots, integrating neuroscience and particularly in BTO biology. Different fields energized me. I'm the type of person that people talk a lot about multidisciplinary teams and interdisciplinary teams. I like to say transdisciplinary because when I worked at NGA, I was acting pod lead for what's called predictive analytics. And the thing that made us different from the outside looking in, it may seem like a mixed bag. You know, we had an epidemiologist, we had myself a neuroscientist, we had image scientists, geographers, environmental scientists. But I liked bringing all those diversity of thoughts together and what that kind of built the programs became much bigger and better. But the thing about it that really excites me at DARPA is you have the expiration date, right? So you come in and you try to spin up all these programs. And so for me, not just spinning up the programs, but actually seeing something transition. I know there's wins and gains in knowledge, increasing the basic knowledge and basic science. Again, I'm very big on actually seeing that in the hands of the end users. So for me, my personal goal is making sure that 
we get something in the hands of boots on the ground or actually or in a desk. We asked Dr. Arthur to highlight what problems she'd like to solve while she's at the agency and her preferred areas of focus. Behavioral and social sciences have been underutilized and underfunded. And DARPA, I think, is really leading the forefront in terms of weaving in behavioral and social sciences. So really pushing the advancing the frontiers there. So particularly looking at like what are some predictive models around neurocognitive performance of individuals and teams. Looking at human-machine teaming, particularly applied social science and studies to really determine the aspects of human-to-human-machine interaction. Working in the operational end and in the operational footprint, my main goal here is to actually get something on the operational floor, actually delivering a, a technology. For me, what really keeps me going is making sure that we are helping boots on the ground and making sure we deliver real innovative technology. DARPA program managers are known for their creativity, enthusiasm, and drive. Outside of obvious technical expertise, what unique insights do you bring to the agency? I think I bring a unique perspective having to work through the whole end-to-end life cycle of R&D development, right? So I've worked from the academic side and the clinical side, working actually with normal populations and clinical populations, actually working with humans, <laughs> and then all the way to trying to like transition technology. And what I've seen in my little under of 13 years in the intelligence community is a lot of the tools that scientists build meet their death and this sort of value of death, right? They can't get it thrown over into operations. And so I bring that unique perspective of usability and what the end user's requirements are and actually working with people up front. A lot of people tend to leave it a task 7 of 7 or task 10 of 10 at the end of their testing to engage with the end users. And I'm very much on a, let's call it, human-centered design, so involving people from the beginning, right? Another area that I'm looking at, DARPA has this LC group, right? This ethics, legal, and societal implications, which I'm really excited to get involved and make LC a more upfront sort of consideration in the not only just PM pitching stage, but in program development stage. Traditionally, LC, I believe, has been siloed in the medical and biological sciences, particularly in BTO projects. People have built up these LC groups, like, for instance, in neurotechnology, when you're talking about brain-computer interfaces, machine interfaces. And one area I'm really interested in is how can we increase LC considerations earlier on in technology development and actually considering what, how can we mitigate the downstream consequences earlier on um, when we're talking about programs. You may be looking, say, for instance, in the area of AI and machine learning. You may have a group of ethicists there. You may have a group of lawyers, social scientists, behavioral science, bring their different angles in terms of ethical and legal implications of the technology that you're developing. So when you talk about LC groups, these are really multidisciplinary, but I call it transdisciplinary because they're all looking at this one <laughs> consideration. It's something larger than within their own field. It's hoping to raise awareness earlier on. So instead of that happening in the latter stages of a technology maturity process, when PMs are consider pitching or working in an area that they actually maybe consult with the LC group earlier in that process. I'm hoping to help with that, make it a more systematic process. Dr. Arthur, do you have any closing thoughts as you begin your tenure here at DARPA? The only thing that really limits you here is your imagination. So again, I came here to be able to, you know, go back to my roots of doing actual um, research in neuroscience and it's like sky's the limit and what you can um, as, as long as it ties back to a DOD relevance and an operational mission relevance, but pretty like pretty much sky's the limit in terms of where you want to go um, as a program manager. Talk to a DARPA PM and share your ideas for what you think the next DARPA program should do. Or think about becoming a program manager yourself, or a contractor, or a partner in one of the Defense Department's many labs and engineering centers. Talk to us, all of us, and exchange ideas. Thank you for listening to this Voices from DARPA podcast and to Tom Shortridge for producing this episode. To learn more about or engage with the agency or to listen to more Voices from DARPA podcast episodes, visit darpa.mil.